I'm still up in Michigan, uh, having a great time at a at, uh, at a retreat center, um, and uh, and this is our last time together. Uh, we've looked uh, at the Gospels. We've looked at the world, the fragmented world of Jesus. Uh, tried to establish this basic principle of listening to the voice of the author, listening to the life situation, listening to the structure, listening to details, and learning to stop and ask what the details mean. It's a fairly simple approach, uh, but I think it's a very, very uh, fruitful uh, approach. So we looked, uh, looked at all the Gospels. We've overviewed all the Gospels now. Um, looked at uh, the life situation that the Gospels were written to. And uh, for this last session, I wanted to look at three passages in the Gospel of John. I wanted to take a little, little extra time with John um, and try to show some of these principles again, what's unique about John, and, um, and this will be our last time together, okay? So uh, let's start with uh, two stories. Um, one of the uniquenesses of John is John has long... Uh, uh, segments that focus on just one person and uh, we're going to look at two, two of those people and I think they're meant to be contrasted uh, one person is sort of uh, a negative example and the other person is a, is a positive example uh, the first person is in chapter 5 I refer to him as, as a man of excuses because every time he opens his mouth uh, he, he utters an excuse um, he, he's, he's been lame for uh, 38 years, and he's lying uh, by the pool of uh, Bethesda, which is still there, the Church of St. Anne, it's, it's, it's all there, it's, and it's an enormous, very deep pool, it's part of the yeah, water system uh, for, the, uh, for the temple. Uh, so let's, let's jump right in, and uh, I'll warn you, I don't like this guy, I don't like this guy at all. This is chapter 5. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews, and John doesn't tell us which one it is, and it's difficult to even guess which one it is. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is, is called Bethesda. Beit is the word for house, and Chesed, uh, which is my favorite word. It's the house of Chesed. Um, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And again, this isn't a little pool like Siloam, a, a kind of a wading pool. This is a very deep pool that feeds water uh, into the temple complex. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the, the, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. In the ancient world, there's a healing power associated with water, and so they're gonna, they're gonna lie around this pool and wait wait for the water to be stirred. That's one variant reading anyway, uh, but there's a healing power associated with, wa <coughs> with water. One who was there had been an invalid, invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he had been in this condition for a long time, so Jesus learned, he had to ask somebody, so this not, he's not omniscient, he asks people's names from time to time and he'll ask questions. So he learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time. He asked him, do you want to get well? And you, you hear that and you say, Jesus, lighten up. I mean, what a politically uh, insensitive thing to ask uh, a person who's uh, handicapped. But Jesus is perfect, right? And everything he says is perfect, right? It was the perfect thing to say. But we're going to learn that this man doesn't want to get well. His disease has become a part of his identity. And, and you see this in that he's always pushing back with his excuses. So um, I just love this about Jesus. He walks up to this man and says, do you want to get well? And here come the excuses. Sir, and by the way, he doesn't know who Jesus is. <coughs> Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. So you've been laying there 38 years and no one's helped you get in first? Uh, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. So that's really two excuses. And I picture his voice is kind of whiny. Then Jesus said to him, get up. This is the absolute lordship of Jesus. 
you'll hear some people falsely uh, teach sometimes that uh, people had to have faith in Jesus in order for him to heal them. Absolutely false. That wouldn't be absolute lordship. This man doesn't know who Jesus is. He's been lame for 38 years. Jesus says, get up. You get up. That's, that's his power. So he, he's not going to listen to any more excuses. He just tells this man, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked. And this is a classic uh, Isaiah 35, uh, Jeremiah 31. Um, the, when the Messiah comes, the lame will leap like deer. So this is a <coughs> very messianic uh, sign. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews, and John uses that term the Jews to mean the Jews who are in leadership. Uh, and so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath, the law forbids you to carry your mat. And they mean the, the oral law. But he replied, the man who made me well, see he doesn't know Jesus, who he is, doesn't know his name. The man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. <coughs> So they ask him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? See, pick up your mat. That's the, that's, they can't see the forest for the trees. Here's a man who's been healed, but the, the real issue is that he's carrying his mat on, on, on Shabbat. Um, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they ask him, who's this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away in the, in the crowd. Later Jesus found him. Now that implies that he looked for him. And I love this image of Jesus looking for this guy. You know, where's the man who was lame? I need to, I need to tell him something. I think it's a really cool image. Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. That sounds a little harsh. I think, he, I think Jesus is appealing to him on, on his own level. This is not, he's not teaching this value system. He's sort of appealing to him on his own level. Uh, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. So I hope you agree with me what a scoundrel this guy is. So the man who healed him after 38 years, kind of checking on him, and he finds out his name, and he goes and tells the Jews that it was Jesus. So join with me in, uh, in, in not liking this guy. I was teaching a Bible study once, and I referred to him as a jerk. And an, an, an older lady in the crowd was very upset that I would call anybody in the Bible a jerk. But uh, So I'm not calling him a jerk, although I think it's fairly self-evident. So there's our, our first uh, long passage with one person. Now let's look at, uh, in chapter 9, the man who was uh, born blind. <coughs> completely different sort of person and um, a completely different story, but I really do think that they're meant to be contrasted. Okay, so this is chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth, and this is another messianic miracle to heal someone who's blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? See, when you live in a world that's based on retributive justice, right? the formula is, if I'm good, God blesses me. If I'm bad, God punishes me. When you see disease, the 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 obvious question is, okay, who sinned? Somebody sinned, so it was either his parents, and they're being punished, or it's him. And the, the rabbis actually taught that an infant could sin in the womb, and that's how it, they explained uh, some birth defects. So, basic basic uh, question that comes right out of the culture, and we think the same way, and we have our own version of that. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. See how Jesus looks at the situation differently? They see a, a, a question of blame. Jesus says, this is a chance for God's glory to be revealed. He says basically the same thing with Lazarus. Jesus sees disease and death, and he sees an opportunity for God to be glorified. Jesus says, as long as, this is verse 4, as long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me, him who sent me is his favorite circumlocution for God in John. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. There's one of the uniquenesses of John. Jesus' life is told as a parable. So he reveals himself as the light of the world. He opens the eyes of a man born blind. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He says, I'm the life. He says, I'm the bread of life. 
he feeds 5,000 people. So his life really is sort of parabolically reveals the truth of who he is. Verse 6, Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent, and that's unique to John. Uh, John is whispering this exp exp uh, uh, explanation. <coughs> so the man went and washed and came home seeing, but he's never seen Jesus. His neighbors and those who'd formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same one who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. And this is also very typically Johannine. Something happens and the people just don't understand. Uh, I call it the motif of misunderstanding. Jesus says something meaningful, or he does something meaningful, and the, the first response of the crowd is that they have no idea of what's going on. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. So here we have this little man who's been healed uh, his whole life. Maybe these aspersions have been cast on him or his parents that he must be some horrible person, that he was, he was born blind. And, and he's this sort of still point in this world that's circling around him for the next uh, several verses. And as much as I dislike the man of excuses, I, I like this little man. He himself insisted, no, I'm the man. How then when your eyes open, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, and if you have a pencil, circle this, the man. It's a little circle around the man. Because what we're going to see is as the, as, the, as the pressure is applied to this man, he is eventually going to realize who Jesus is. And the man is his first step, just sees Jesus as a man. Okay? The man they called Jesus, and is it nice? He learned his name. The other man didn't learn his name after he'd been healed, but this man did. The man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. He's going to tell the story over and over again. Where is the man, they asked him. I don't know, he said, because Jesus healed him, and he just left like the other man. They brought to the Pharisees the man who'd been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. So here we have another Sabbath violation. In the first one, it was the man carrying his mat. In the second one, it's Jesus making the mud. We, we know that Jesus doesn't have to use mud to heal someone, right? He can just say, be healed, or go, or you know, whatever, stretch out your hand, or go home, your servant's well. He doesn't need to do these things. So the idea, I think, is he's purposely breaking their oral law every chance he gets. The oral law said uh, that uh, you cannot spit on the Sabbath because the spit might run downhill. If it runs downhill, it makes mud. And you'll see throughout their investigation, the Pharisees are not interested in the healing. They're interested in the fact that Jesus made mud. Just like they don't understand that the man who was lame for 38 years has been healed. They're not interested in that. They're interested in the fact that he's carrying something and he's not supposed to be doing that. And uh, again, we laugh and we roll our eyes, but we have our own version of these kinds of you know, religious rules that we, we, uh, we make up. <coughs> so Jesus made the mud on the Sabbath. That's the issue for them. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he'd received his sight. He put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. So a kind of short version of the story again. Some of the Pharisees said, or I would translate it, some of the Pharisees concluded, this man is not from God, he does not keep the Sabbath. So he does a clearly messianic miracle of healing someone who's born blind. Only the Messiah can do that. And he, he can't be from God because he spit and made mud, broke the rules. But others ask, uh, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs so they were divided, and we had the same thing in chapter 7, uh, verse 43. Finally, they turned again to the man, to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. You get your pencil ready. The man replied, he's a prophet. See, first it was the man they called Jesus, and now he goes, well, he must be a prophet. What's a prophet? A prophet is someone who says what God would say if God were there, in, in, in essence. So he's, 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 uh, he's made a progression. The Jews still did not believe that he'd been blind and received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. 
Is this one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? So a very thorough investigation. We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age, he'll speak for, for himself. He does not want to have anything to do. They do not want to have anything to do with this because someone is eventually going to be banned and kicked out of the synagogue, and they don't want to have any part of this. Okay, And so now we have another unique uh, uh, characteristic of John. John is going to whisper an explanation to us, and only John does this. He does it like 59 times in his gospel. His parents said this. Hear him explaining? Hear the tone change? His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. And that's why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So John explained that motivation for us. Thank you, John. A second time, they summoned the man who'd been, been, been blind. <coughs> Give glory to God. Now this is, just, this, is, this is a juridical charge. We say, tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But in Judaism, the charge is, uh, and this comes out of Joshua 7.19, um, yeah, give glory to God. Solemn charge to tell the truth. We know this man is a sinner. because they, They've already concluded that. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. It's, this, this man is just so endearing. He sees the truth. He's progressing in his understanding of Jesus. And he's, he's either very foolish or very courageous because he's, he, uh, he says things to these, uh, these, uh, uh, these people in authority that uh, you know, it would be, better. It would be better, better if he was more like his parents and kind of kept his mouth shut. But he doesn't do that, and which, which makes, <laughs> makes me like him even more. Then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? See, they want to hear about the mud. He answered, I've told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Now, invariably, when I teach this in a class, people laugh because it's funny. He, he's tweaking the nose of the Supreme Court, right? And um, people have been laughing at that for 2,000 years. It's just, it's funny. It's funny. They hurled insults at him. You're this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. They claim that the oral law came straight from Moses, that God delivered the oral law to Moses on Mount Sinai the same time he delivered uh, the Ten Commandments. And so they are the disciples of Moses. And Jesus says, you know, you, you, you set your hopes on Moses. They, they had this belief, they had this connection, their authority. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. Now in 752, they knew that he was from Nazareth. So they're clearly confused. The man answered, I just love this. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from? And yet he opened my eyes? And now he's going to quote from them, quote to them from their own playbook. They cannot say no to what he's about to say. Listen to what he says. We know this man, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will, right? They can't say no to that. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. Get your pencil ready. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So the man they call Jesus, hmm, he must be a prophet. Oh, if he wasn't from God, uh, he could do nothing. So see, the, as the pressure is applied, this man understands more and more. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth, how dare you lecture us, and they threw him out. And that just doesn't mean that they threw him out of the synagogue, that means he's kicked out of Jewish life. His parents, who we heard a minute ago, can't talk to him anymore. They can't give him food, he can't come to their house. Uh, the phrase in Judaism is, you're dead to me, you're banned. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, just like he looked for the other man, Jesus looks for this man and finds him. See, it's not enough that Jesus heals him. Jesus doesn't want to just give him his gift. Jesus wants to give him himself. Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe him. Jesus said, you're seeing him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you. Get your pencil ready. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. 
It's a wonderful, you know, pr wonderful progression. Uh, I, I just love that story, <coughs> and I love that little man. Okay, let's quick, quickly look at one more story, and this is chapter 7. And as, as I said before, this story is the reason that I wanted to uh, study uh, the Bible, spend my life studying the Bible, and I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. Okay, so we're in chapter 7 of John. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea. Galilee is safer, not totally safe, but safer. <coughs> because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. There are several plots. Uh, the first one begins in Mark chapter 3. His whole ministry, basically Jesus is not safe. There are people who are plotting to take his life. So he's going to stay up in Galilee where the, the heat is not so intense. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, and we know he has four brothers, Mark tells us their names, but Jesus' brothers said to him, you ought to uh, leave here and go to Judea so your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, show yourself to the world. Now, if we didn't have John's explanation, which is about to come up, we would think, well, wow, cool, his brothers believe in him. They want him to go down and kind of, you know, let the world know what's going on. But John is going to whisper the explanation to us, and he does that in verse 5. And this lets us know the whole tone of what his brothers uh, just said. It was sarcasm. John says, he whispers in your ear, for even his own brothers didn't believe in him. So that was all said sarcastically. Uh, so now let's jump over to verse 37. Let me stop and just talk about tabernacles for a second. When you hear tabernacles, it's, it's called different things. It's one of the three big feasts, uh, Pentecost, uh, Passover, and tabernacles. Tabernacles, it's sometimes in Judaism, it's called Sukkoth, uh, or booths, uh, or tabernacles. When you hear tabernacles, just think Thanksgiving. It's a, it's a festival uh, of, of bringing in the crops. That's the agricultural significance. It's a celebration of joy before the Lord, who blesses crops. That's what uh, the uh, Tanakh says. And it, it was a festival of joy. Uh, there was a lot of raucous parties and, uh, and that sort of thing, a lot of drinking. Uh, there's a story of one rabbi who could do a backflip and land on his fingertips. I'd kind of like to see that. Uh, but that so that's an agricultural significance. Um, by the way, there, you're living in a world where if the crops don't come in, you might starve to death. So. It's a big party. We're gonna, she, we're gonna get to live for another year. Our, our culture doesn't understand this, because for us, every meal we have is a, is a feast. Um, so anyway, that's the agricultural significance. The um, historical significance. It's a celebration of uh, God's provision uh, in the wilderness, because in the wilderness, the children of Israel lived in booths or tabernacles. Okay. So here's the, uh, here's the moment that changed everything for me. Verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast. Stop right there. Okay, that's 37 verses later. It was in the first of the chapter that we were told it was tabernacles. 37 verses later, most people have forgotten what feast it was anyway. Um, but now we're told it's the last and greatest day of the feast of tabernacles. And you can kind of do your homework to find out what happens. And let me tell you what happens. On the last and greatest day of the feast, uh, the high priest would can't congregate with a, a huge group of people, 35-acre courtyard. This may be the largest crowd Jesus ever spoke to. It very likely is. He stands on the front porch of the temple with a, a pitcher, silver or gold, some, uh, sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's silver in, in the record. And they process down to the pool of Siloam. He fills the pitcher and then he goes back up and everyone's dancing and, and you know singing and it's just this raucous festival. The rabbi said, he who has not seen tabernacles has not seen joy. It's a very joyful time. So they process back up to the temple court. The, the, the high priest goes back up on the porch and to commemorate Moses striking the rock in the wilderness, he pours the water out and he quotes Isaiah 12, 3. So this, this is the moment this is why I'm here, and we're together right now, this moment. He pours the water out in front of the crowd, and he shouts across the crowd, Isaiah 12, 3, which says, With joy 
you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Okay? Back to the text. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud, shouted, loud voice, If a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. That, that detail changed my life. And, it, and it, it, you see how it just makes that whole scene uh, come to life. So I'm going to end right there because our time is up. And um, I hope this has been helpful to you. It's been very encouraging to me. And uh, I, I think uh, we're going to see each other soon uh, live w w without a video screen in between us. So God bless you.